I have two points. The first point about exoticism, I think that that's one of the problems that I see with world music as well, is it allows us to become virtual tourists, as Claus was saying, where we can actually experience other cultures and other parts of the world with no complexity whatsoever, not even the complexity of language or having to interact with people, having to see them, smell them, eat their food, see what's going on. So it's a virtual interaction that seems even further removed than something like the Internet. And on the concept, we were talking about this after lunch, sound versus music. The term music bothers me as well, because looking at it from a non-musician's viewpoint, and also from, I guess if I look at it from a physiological and a psychological viewpoint, vision we can turn off, but sound, we don't have ear lids. We can't block it out. So sound in a sense is tyrannical. And I wonder if our reaction and our need to construct it into music and our need to have elevator music in the background, it's not sound drowning out sound, sound erasing other sound, and sound that human beings have constructed and made order out of. Well, Matt was saying at lunch that where he lives is so noisy. There's so much noise that the only way he can fight back is to blast his own music, to create a sort of sound space around him so he can be unique or inside, if I paraphrased you correctly. But I like the aspect of contact, because this contact, smelling and tasting in other culture is a process of synthesis and not exoticism. Exoticism is always on the surface, on a certain distance, using something in a kitchen way. It's not a connection, a combination. And I think that's pretty difficult to differentiate, because it seems to me that there's a fine line between what someone considers appropriation and what someone considers quoting, right? What's the difference between using a piece of a song? I mean, we were talking about the slave song in Moby just the other day. I mean, that's interesting, because I'm not talking specifically about that song, but I mean, as an example of if you use something, is it out of – what's the difference between using it appropriately or not? I think that's sort of a tricky thing to work with. I mean, I understand the idea of having some sort of commitment to the – or relationship, at least, that goes beyond, this sounds novel to me, I'm going to use it without knowing anything about it. But in the case of your Australian group using their own instruments, I mean, to me, I mean, yes, if it's because they think it will lend validity to a pop group, then maybe that's problematic. But I think it's difficult to say, oh, this is good, this is not. Isn't part of that having to do with really the context? Like, you look at something like Moby putting that song in there. He was, as Ian was saying, it just sounded good. It fit in there because it sounded good. But with something like world music, it has this intentionality. It has this political sort of motivation of let's mix things to bring things together, to cross cultural boundaries, to – it has an intentional, almost sociological function, it seems, or it just has a different intention. Well, it can. Sometimes sitars just sound good. You know, like, there's always that effect, but it's not always – But would they call themselves, like, a world musician, like somebody that would fit into the category of world music and have the intention of bringing music from around the world? Doesn't it have a, you know, is it often motivated in that sense? Well, but look at – it's the same thing Chantal Ackerman was saying. I mean, with intentionality, if you remember when she was saying when she takes the pictures of people and how that square front on thing, and she was talking about respect, right, that you use your intentionality in terms of your relationship to the subject if you respect that subject, and therefore you take from that subject in a certain way, and that's different from what Moby is doing because they're taking it 
in a more voyeuristic or manipulative way than, you know, and I think intentionality matters. But how, I mean, where that hat comes across. <laughs> well, maybe that matters even more. Maybe the whole groups, the groups of, of people that are into world music and, and feeling that they are contacting other cultures is more important than the intentionality of the, maybe the scene is more important than the intentionality of the artist itself. I, it strikes me this is relevant to what Tracy was saying the other day about um, being able to speak only if you have the you know, the idea of, of speaking representative of a group or that sort of thing, which I think, I mean, as she was saying, it's kind of a complex thing. You know, you're sort of in a catch-22, whether you use something and you are using it as a representative for a group or, I mean, what if what if um, a white artist is using a, a, a mm-hmm. folk slave song in a piece? Or what if, you know, I decided to do a Hindi, whatever. I mean, what, does that matter? It, it, whether it matters or not is kind of irrelevant. I think that the con- that, that what's going to happen after that, what it would mean would be interpreted differently. Whether it mattered, I mean, we can say, no, it doesn't matter. We can decide that today, but, I mean, group consensus is going to come along and, you know, and give meaning to that. And, you know, we all know what would happen in those, in those, in those contexts. It would, it would be a completely different meaning. So you see, Michael, your talk needs another chapter. <laughs> the chapter missing there because you present just a, a good case, so to speak. You know, you give all this example and you are in kind of favor and supportive of this globalization thing, done in the right way, so to speak. You know, but you kind of miss out the critical question because there are obviously a very critical question you have heard of. Uh, a few here, I think they kind of boiled down what one said, that is that I'm somebody between culture. Mm-hmm. So, but and some of you who speak in another language like me know what it means to be between languages, for example, or be between culture. You lose a lot. Mm-hmm. You gain some, right? And you mm-hmm. talked about There's the gains. Gap. But you but but you lose something and in and the question is, you know, you, you become an, an alphabet in both languages. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah. so your only hope is, in some direction, as you point out, to find a language which is not defined as in between, mm-hmm. but is a language of it's own. your own. Right. Mm-hmm. And this is, therefore, in music or sound, very difficult. Because in music and sound, it's not something to construct, actually, even at the end. Certainly, it is a construction. But, it, but you need your evidence, your life experience for it. The sounds you understand are the sounds of your childhood, and the sounds of your mother's womb. That is the sounds you are still related to. And they sound pretty different in India and in, in Hamburg, Germany. Believe me. You know? So it is, how do you get this? Are you creating now your artificial womb after that? You know? Also, it is, it, what I mean is, here we generate sound with a material at hand. But what kind of original evidence, subjective material, do we still have after we bent out of our, what we, we cannot avoid it out of our, yes?